Side Hustle Show 83, how a strong personal brand wins clients, plus three live listener brand audits. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your nine to five may make you a living, but your five to nine makes you alive. And now your host, Nick Loper. Hey everybody, Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show. This is the 83rd edition of our program, and we're going to dive into how your personal brand, inside and outside of work, can help make a positive name for yourself and translate into real business, real dollars, real client relationships. I'm joined by Jessica Lawler, a personal branding expert who really walks the walk. And I asked around, I said, who else should I have on the show? And multiple people mentioned Jessica. So I'm very excited to have her on and get gutsy, which is her hashtag. I should say hashtag get gutsy. Uh, this is going to be a fun conversation because it's half, uh, you know, the how-to interview style uh, that you're used to and half uh, live listener brand audits. We've got uh, three sites from audience volunteers to go through and pick apart and identify opportunities for improvement. I think you'll get a lot out of that. And and here's the awesome part. Jessica is offering up the chance to win a free branding boot camp, a $200 value. Uh, to enter, all you need to do is leave a comment on the show notes for this episode at sidehustlenation.com slash 83 with your number one branding struggle and your URL, and we're going to select a winner on December 19th. Uh, on that page at sidehustlenation.com slash 83, you'll also find a free downloadable, downloadable PDF with all the notes and links from this episode, including how you can get Jessica's personal branding checklist and more. Ready? Let's do this. Hey, Jessica, welcome to the Side Hustle Show. Hey, Nick. Thanks so much for having me. Everybody, I'm joined by Jessica. She's a PR professional by day, a side hustler extraordinaire by night and by early morning, and she'll hopefully we'll get into that, um, offering blog management, content creation, public speaking, branding, boot camps, and more. She says, none of this would have been possible had it not been for the concerted effort she's put into building her own personal brand. So this is a, a good topic to get into for side hustlers. So we should start at the, we should start with definitions. What is a personal brand? Sure. So, you know, people have so many different definitions of a personal brand, but I think what it actually boils down to is something really simple. So to me, a personal brand is your online and offline reputation. And really it's what immediately comes to mind when someone says your name. All right. That sounds good. What do you, what do you want people to think of when they say your name or when they hear your name? Sure. So lots of things. I mean, for me, I want them to think, um, you know, great writer, responsible, reliable, meets deadlines, kind of all of those positive attributes that you think of, especially when you think of someone um, who might be providing you services. So, you know, for solopreneurs, those are definitely some things that you want people to think of. And I think, you know, there's so many different ways that you can brand yourself both online, but I think it also is important that it your reputation online translates offline as well. So kind of keeping that consistency and consistency is something that has emerged as really important for me when it comes to personal branding too. Just in terms of like the, the aesthetics, the design, the, you know, whatever else that's going on. Yeah, all of that. So the design and the aesthetic, of course, but I think in the way that you carry yourself and, and the way that you act. So when you meet someone um, offline who you may have met on Twitter or met through your blog or through a website, I always hope that when people meet me in person, they say, that's exactly what I thought she would be like. That's exactly how she portrays herself online. I think that consistency and in, in personality really helps to develop your brand too. Oh my gosh. I hope people say the same thing when they meet me. They're probably like, <laughs> oh, that's your, that's your real voice. Oh, okay. That's not your radio voice. <laughs> your uh, podcast voice. Your podcast voice. Um, is this just a fancy word for blogging? Like, can I, can I have a personal brand without a blog? Absolutely. And I think a blog absolutely helps. And we'll get into why I think having a 
personal blog or a website is so important, but you can absolutely have a personal brand um, without a blog. So, you know, we'll talk some more about Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Google Plus. There's all these social media sites that you can develop a personal brand on as well. Um, but of course, um, my biggest recommendation would be to have that, you know, home on the web where people can really find everything about you and that kind of starting point for developing your brand. Yeah, I'm an advocate of of blogging as well, and so I've actually gone kind of the opposite path. So I started out writing in 2009, maybe on a on a personal domain, maybe even before that, um, and then in 2013 made the switch over to Side Hustle Nation. So all of the old uh, NickLoper.com content is still is still out there. If you dig deep enough into the archives, you can you can find it. But what I found was there. Even though it was on a personal domain, it was, and I guess it was a personal branded thing, but there wasn't much consistency to the content. It was, uh, you, you know, there was some stuff on marketing, some stuff on entrepreneurship, because that was what was going on in uh, in my life, and that was, you know, what I wanted to write about. But there was also stuff like, here's pictures of our dog, here's what happened on our vacation. It wasn't, there was no, unless somebody cared about me personally, there was no real reason to stick around. And so while everyone else was kind of transferring to their, their personal domain, I was like, I got to go the opposite direction. I want to, you know, make a clean break and, and say this is uh, going to be specifically about side hustle stuff now. Huh. So I find that really interesting, actually, because I, I kind of have the opposite train of thought. So I you know, my website is under my name, jessicalaller.com. And of course, I, I blog about my side hustle and writing and um, getting gutsy, which is the topic of my blog. But I think it's great when I get to know a blogger on a more personal level. So I think you um, showing pictures of your dog or vacations or things that you're doing actually could benefit you um, from, you know, people seeing, oh, my God, Nick is a real person. And like, look at his family. That's awesome. And um, I think that that actually helps. And for me, I've noticed, especially with my audience, people seem to be really interested in in the personal side as well. And it's kind of helped translate to the professional side. Okay. Okay. You know, that's something that I have, have gotten some feedback on, I guess, you know, in, inject more you, inject more personal stories into the, into the business related stuff. Because, hey, it's, you know, this is you know, this is your personal story. You know, there's no need to to write in the third person all the time. You can talk about, you know, what's going on. And and so do try and do a little bit of that. But I, for some reason, I felt that it would be more brandable, um, not on a personal domain, but it seems to be mm -hmm. uh, against the against the trend a little bit in that, in, especially if you have, um, I don't know, I don't know. Some people are, are making the transition the opposite direction, like like yourself, to go the, the personal branded route or the personal domain. I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, for me, that was almost a cop out. I didn't want to think of a clever blog name. <laughs> um, and I was like, you know, I'm just going to go with my name. And I already owned my domain and it had previously just been a static website um, when I was um, job searching several years ago for my first job out of college. And then I, you know, transitioned it into my blog. And I think eventually I probably will buy a domain that, you know, more corresponds with, you know, the name of my my current brand. But for now, it it has been working. Is get, is get Gutsy taken already? I think that it is, but I'm going to go with like Get Gutsy Headquarters or Get Gutsy HQ. I'll find some other way to get it in there. Oh, I hate it. I hate it when people steal my great domain. But <laughs> I know. If you, if you haven't registered your personal domain already, I highly recommend that you do because, mm -hmm. you know, you want to own your you want to own your personal real estate, whether or not you you use it for your your blog, your brand, whatever. Um, talk to me about can the specific actions you've taken to to grow this blog to grow this uh this brand this reputation because you know just blogging for itself we've kind of harped on this in in past episodes like that's not really uh that's not really a business there's got to be something behind the you know behind the curtain or something that that the blog is driving traffic to that's driving eyeballs to Sure, definitely. So just to give a little bit of background, my my business is kind of twofold. So you know, I started out, I'm a public relations professional by day. Um, and I started doing a lot of freelance writing and blog management on the side about two years ago. So those are the kinds, um, <clears throat> excuse me, of clients that I'm trying to, to work with. However, on the other side of the spectrum, I have this, what I call my get gutsy blog. And 
getting gutsy is all about stepping outside your comfort zone to reach your goals and, and to live a life that really makes you truly happy. And so that is what I would love to grow my business into more. So the blog features content about all of those topics. So freelance writing, my you know yoga practice, running, personal branding. It kind of, it covers a lot of different topics all under that, that one umbrella. And so of course, I'm trying to gain clients by showcasing my writing skills, showcasing the way I manage my own blog, but I'm also developing products and eBooks um, under the Get Gutsy brand too. So I kind of have this twofold approach at the moment, but I would say that I started the Get Gutsy blog two years ago um, with this goal of really just developing a, a bigger brand and reaching more people, but also gaining more clients. And so I post about two times a week. And I think that's something really important um, that I want to stress is that you don't have to be blogging every day to, to have a successful side hustle. You can be doing it once a week, once a month, twice a month, whatever your consistency is, just kind of keep it you know, so people know when to expect you. But I only, I blog twice a week. Um, one of the posts is the same every week. It's called Start Your Week Right Sunday. And it's just basically a link roundup. And I also outline my goals for the coming week ahead. And so that's something people have come to expect on Sundays. And then in addition to that, I usually post one other blog per week. So I'm not spending too much time on the blog, but the blog is driving, um, you know, people to the services page on my site, to the testimonials page on my site. And that's how I'm able to gain clients. So the blog has been super helpful, but also I would say the next driver of clients for me has been Twitter. And I've been active on Twitter for several years. I think I'm up to like six years now, six or seven and um, very active and people have found me there too. So I think there's so many different tools available to you and they don't have to take a lot of time. Um, at Jess Law, if you are uh, want to follow along. We were, we were joking about this before the thing. 48,000 tweets. Yeah, you've been active on uh, you've been active on Twitter, I'd say. <laughs> Just a little bit active. <laughs> I've uh, I think I have like 4,000 or something. So you, you've 12x'd me on the, uh, on the tweeting. <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty good stuff. What you so how are people discovering this site? So that's, I think that's everyone's fear. I'm going to start a blog and I'm just going to be writing into a vacuum. And, and that's mm -hmm. crazy frustrating. It's like, like, I'm putting my best stuff out there. Like how are, how are people discovering it? Sure. So I would say, you know, my first major tip here with when you start a blog is it's really important, obviously, to put your best foot forward and put out great content. But more importantly than that, you need to promote your work. So I, that is such a common frustration when people start blogging that they're not getting comments or no one's looking at their blog, their traffic is really low and they get discouraged. And a lot of times they stop blogging or they say, you know, I didn't see any benefit from it, so I'm stopping. So I put a lot of emphasis on, on promotion and promotion of my posts. And, you know, I like to use what I call the rule of three. And basically that's anytime I you know, publish a post or publish a new piece of content somewhere. I like to promote it in at least three different spots, whether that's Twitter or a Google Plus post or LinkedIn or pinning it to a Pinterest board. I like to make sure I'm doing it at least three times, if not more. On Twitter, I if I publish a new post, I usually post about it on Twitter two or three times a day. And of course, I'm not, you know, doing them one after another, spreading them out at times that makes sense. But you know, Twitter and social media sites, they move so fast that I think it's okay sometimes to be pushing things more than once, especially on a site like Twitter. But people, are, so people are finding my posts through that. Um, but I would also say, and I would love to share the story of how I actually got um, my first blog management client actually came from, from my blog and Twitter combined. So as I just mentioned a little bit ago, I have this weekly roundup. It's called Start Your Week Right Sunday. And every Sunday, I put maybe my five or six favorite links from the week on all different topics, public relations, social media, you know, working out, fitness, health, just any kind of topic, anything I saw throughout the week that I thought was interesting. Okay. I, I link to it. I say who the author was. I link to their blog or, you know, wherever it was that it was published. And I write a little sentence about, you know, why I liked it, why it resonated with me. From there, you know, after I publish it, of course, as I just mentioned, I like to promote my work. So I, I promote it on Twitter. And I always am sure to include the Twitter handles of the people that I featured. I think this is a really great way, especially for, for new bloggers, to kind of get the attention of bigger bloggers or people that they want to, you know, get in front of. Okay, that, that was my next question. By. That's good. That was my next yeah. question. Well, what if, you, what if you have zero Twitter followers? Okay. Right. So that's a way to just, you know, say, hey, I'm here. I like your work. 
And from that, actually, um, I, I, you know, included a post from this guy who um, wrote a really great blog post about PR. And, you know, he saw it, he thanked me. And then, you know, a day later, I got an email from him. And he said, I was looking at your site. And it was really interesting. I see that you work in PR, and you're a writer, I would love to just, you know, have a phone call with you. So we got on the phone and, you know, I wasn't even thinking that anything was going to come from it. I'm always just up for talking to interesting new people. And he told me about his company and and what he was doing. And I thought it was interesting. And he asked if I would want to write a guest blog post for him. And I said, sure, why not? At the time, I was really looking to do a lot of guest blog posts. And again, that's another really good way to to gain attention and traffic back to your blog. Um, So I said, yes, I wrote this guest blog post. He seemed to like it. And then from there, he said, are there any other other ways we could work together? He said, we have a blog and we're looking to, you know, do more posts and get more writers involved. Is that something that you do? And the light bulb starts to go off. (laughs) Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. And, you know, I hadn't done something to that magnitude before, but I manage my own blog and I've helped manage other blogs at different jobs. And I said, sure, I can certainly put together a proposal. So, you know, I put together a proposal, we talked it out. And then, you know, a couple months later, I was working with them. And now I've been working with them for almost a year and a half on their blog. So that... Yeah. So that came just from, you know, publishing a post because I truly admired something that this guy wrote and then promoting it on my social media account. I really like uh, I really like the idea of doing the link, the link roundup. That's a much easier way to to write a to, you know, kind of meet your editorial calendar instead of creating something completely from scratch every week. And it, you know, gives other people shout outs, makes them feel good. Uh, that's a really cool way to go about it. And then it le- it led to this, uh, it led to this long-term, long-term client. Mm-hmm. How did you figure out what, what was in the proposal? Like, Hey, I've, I've never done this on this scale before. How do you figure out how much to, to charge? Sure. So I, you know, one, I think it's always great to have mentors and and trusted, you know, friends that you can talk to about these things. And I'm lucky enough that I, you know, through this awesome, you know, solopreneur and side hustling community, I've gotten to know a lot of people who've done work like this. So I was able to kind of reach out and just get some ideas around what people were charging. But also um, what I did was I put together a proposal that had three different options. So I figured this was kind of my best chance to outline everything that I could do. So of course, there was the most expensive option that featured, you know, a ton of services and kind of more that he might have been asking for, you know, than a middle ground one and then kind of like a, you know, basic plan. And I just kind of outlined what I would do. And sometimes, you know, I think you just have to roll with these things and make it up as you go. Um, I like to say, just fake it till you make it. And as bad as that sounds, it actually works. It really does. And and you learn and you adjust. But so I, I put together this proposal. I got some feedback from some friends who've done freelance work. And, you know, it seemed like everything was good and fair. And from there, you know, sent it off. And then, you know, of course, we went through some negotiations and we kind of picked and chose from um, different parts of each three plans and then, you know, agreed on a number. No, that's really cool. I never would have even thought to put together like a menu menu style pricing, but that's what all I mean, that's what so many companies do. It's like do you want small, medium, or large? Okay. And then, you know, generally people end up somewhere in the middle. So super, super smart. Right. And that approach was actually really helpful for kind of setting the standard for what I do for other clients now. And it helped me, you know, I hadn't developed this as a service that I was planning to offer. This was the first time someone had really approached me with it. And now it's something that if someone else were to reach out to me, I could, you know, go back to that original proposal and kind of, you know, fix it from there and and send it off. So it was kind of good in getting me organized and saying, hey, this is actually a service that people want and that I can promote. Very, very cool. How, how else has the blog uh, driven, driven business your way? Sure. So, you know, the blog has led to so many different opportunities and a lot of them are, have been like this, a podcast interview or um, a webinar or even in-person speaking opportunities. And those are all ways that I'm able to get in front of a new audience. And I, I really love that. And I like to spread the word about getting gutsy and what I'm doing. And, you know, the blog has been super helpful with that. I've also been able to receive a lot of different freelance writing gigs from people who have seen my writing. And I think that's one really awesome thing about having a blog is that you're able to showcase all of your work and people are able to 
get an idea of what it is that you have to offer before they even have to reach out to you. I mean, I say that my blog is my resume, my cover letter, my portfolio all rolled into one. You basically know what you're going to get right. before you even have to say hello to me or email me. Um, and I think that's, I really love that. And I think it's a really good vetting process. So people are just able to see exactly what you have to offer. At what point do you transition from doing guest posts for free to being like, no, I'm a freelance writer now. You'll you'll pay me for my article. That's a good question. And it's kind of something I'm grappling with now. I mean, people always say once you get to a certain point, you shouldn't write for free. And I don't agree with that a hundred percent. That I will still write for free if it is for a site that I feel is really going to help me reach my goals. Um, but I would say that after about a year, a year and a half, I stopped actively searching out guest blog post opportunities. And honestly, the reason why is because I wasn't seeing a ton of traffic from those sites back to my blog. And some of the blogs had really big audiences. And I don't know what it was or why, but I, I just wasn't seeing the return. And I realized that my time was better spent developing my own products now that I've been able to kind of build up a community of my own. Yeah, you just never know. I'm an, you know, I'm an advocate of, of guest blogging as well, but I think it's got to be the right fit. Some of like the, you know, the big like brand name sites, they don't actually get that much engagement on their posts because they're, because they're posting like, you know, five articles a day or five updates a day or something. And so I don't know the ones that are run by, you know, a single person, I think those still do pretty well. Like with, they've got a lot of comments, they've got a lot of engagement. I think those ones uh, still, at least, at least for me, they tend to perform better. Um, Definitely, I agree. Let's uh, jump into this uh, this branding boot camp. So this is a service you offer. It's got a two hundred dollar price tag, and uh, and I put out the feelers this morning in uh, in an email. That said, hey, if you uh, if you would like uh, Jess and I to take a look um, at your site and evaluate your personal branding, um, no no holds barred. Like you, you know, you mm -hmm. give us the authorization to uh, to share it all, good bad. Uh, good, bad, and ugly. You know, uh, let's let's see what we got. So we have three victims uh, to to go through, <laughs> and uh, you know these they'll probably have updated the sites by the time you're listening to this. By the time uh, you can uh, you can give some feedback, but hopefully uh, the idea behind this is you know there are some general rules, and actually just has put together a, um, a a personal branding checklist that you can check out, and we'll link to that in uh, in the show notes. But there's some general rules to apply, and so we're going to go through these sites with an eye for some of the some of those uh, branding elements. And so the first one we have is PharmacySchoolHQ.org. This is uh, this is my buddy Alex, who's running this uh, pharmacy school. Very good example of an authority site or a potential authority site for aspiring pharmacy students. Okay. So I'm looking at Alex's site now and, you know, at first glance, it looks pretty good. So I'm on here and I, the first thing I see is a video. So that's great. I, you know, immediately want to kind of click and watch that. And right next to the video, I see a sign up box, um, you know, for an email newsletter or some kind of offering. So that's great. I think that's all really good stuff. However, something that I definitely see missing here is I don't see any about page. And I'm, you know, I'm typically used to seeing that at the top. So I'm looking at the, the top of the page and I don't see those, you know, typical tabs, you know, about, contact, who we are, services. I don't see any of that. So, you know, I'm scrolling down and I see a little bit more information, um, but it's still a little bit unclear. And I do see social tabs at the bottom. So that's really good. I always highly recommend having social tabs, um, maybe even considering moving them to the top so people can get to them a little faster. But I would say that um, the first thing that I tend to see people look for um, on my site and on a lot of other sites is an about page. And I think your about page is a crucial place where you are able to really kind of grab someone's attention and explain to them why they should stick around. And I think a lot of people get confused with about pages because they think it's supposed to be about them. And in a way, yes, it is, but it's more about your audience and it's about what you can deliver to your audience. And that's what you need to communicate in the about page. So I don't see anything like that here. So I would highly recommend that Alex um, work on creating an about page that explains exactly what this is, who it's for and what they're going to get when they sign up. 
We will link to uh, Jessica's about page as a good example. So it says you exactly first, let's talk about you. You know, this is the about me page, but first let's talk about you. It tells your story and then it has 10 fun facts about you. So I think that's really cool. And then an an invitation or call to action. Hey, join the movement, join my email list, whatever, uh, whatever else is going on now. On, on Alex's site, on pharmacyschoolhq.org, there are those social links down at the very bottom, but the Google Plus one and the Twitter one don't link anywhere. So that would be something to Uh-oh. address as well. Definitely, but good start. And I mean, I love I love that there's a YouTube presence. I think video is something that I have thought about getting into and I'm a little scared and holding back. Um, so I think it's awesome that he's already, you know, doing video, but definitely just having some more information on here would be really helpful in, in getting people to stay on your site and, and want to learn more about, about what's going on here. Absolutely. No, he's very good on the YouTube channel. It's definitely his face in front of the camera. That's, I mean, that's the definition of, of a personal brand, but I think there is uh, definitely a lot more that could be done. Like, cause this is specifically about pharmacy school. I expected to see something about, Hey, this was my experience in, in getting into pharmacy school. These are, you know, some of my best study practices. And, you know, this is how I was able to get a sweet pharmacist job after the fact, if you right. want to, if you want to learn how to do the same, you know, sign up here or sign up today. Definitely. What do you think about this? He's got a big old sign up or he's got a big old uh, send us a message. Instead of having a contact page, he's just got at the bottom of his site, he just has a giant send us a message full width box here. Um, what do you think about that? So I'm not a huge fan of a full width box. I think it's a little bit distracting, but I actually, I do like this approach. I think it's really interesting because a lot of people hide their um, contact box um, or their email address on, you know, a separate page, a contact page, maybe I know I do. And it's not that I'm discouraging people from contacting me. I just, you know, I don't know, just don't have it on my homepage. Um, So I think it's kind of cool actually that he's encouraging people to reach out. But I, again, I don't really understand the call to action or, or why would they be reaching out? Send us a message, but why? Is there something specific? There's no call to action here. Um, so I think it might be a little bit unclear. Um, so maybe just kind of clarifying that would would be really useful. I'd be interested to know if um, people are, are utilizing that box. Yeah, I guess that's that's the telltale thing is, you know, whether or not it's being utilized or whether it's just sitting there and, and doing nothing. And maybe it's worth right. testing out. Oh, do, should we put a should we put an email opt in there instead? Kind of mm-hmm. one last catch all effort down at the bottom of the page instead of. Uh, just that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I, that's kind of what I assumed it was at first. And then I see, Oh, it says send us a message. So I might accidentally, you know, try to sign up here thinking that it was a newsletter box since I'm so used to seeing those at the bottom of pages. Right. Very, very cool. The next site we have is Avery learning lab.com. This is okay. Amanda who is, um, We'll take a look. We'll try and figure out what she's uh, what she's doing. It says fun, enriching learning activities for all. Okay. So let's see. At first glance of Amanda's website, I'm a little bit taken aback by the different fonts and colors that I'm seeing. So, you know, a lot of people are scared to start a website because they are not a designer or they don't have, you know, extra money to to hire a designer to create a beautiful website for them. But I do think that having a simple, you know, clean layout is really important for keeping people engaged and for, for helping people take you seriously, take you and your brand and your business seriously. So when I first look at this, I'm a little bit distracted by um, the background photo, which looks like it's of like a forest or trees. And then Amanda's photo is there. And I think it's awesome that Amanda's photo is front and center. That's something that I highly recommend, especially if you want people to connect with you as the personal brand and and the person running the business. I, I think it's awesome to include a photo of yourself. But the way it's positioned here on this site, it's kind of on top of the forest photo. And it's just a little bit um, distracting. And same with the the font colors. So as we scroll down, I'm seeing a lot of different colors. And I think that that just has kind of emerged as a no-no when it comes to websites and and personal branding. Um, I think sticking to kind of one or two core colors will help people take you more seriously. I see what Amanda's trying to do here. I think she's trying to draw attention to certain sections of the page. But I think that there's other ways to do that. So maybe instead of using these colors, maybe it's different sizes. So on things she wants to kind of emphasize, maybe making it a little bigger or utilizing 
more bold or italics. So I think there's ways to do that. And also I'm noticing kind of in the middle of the page, um, there's a box and it says parent and family coaching sessions. And then there's a picture, but it, it looks a little bit like clip art. And again, just going back to people taking your brand seriously, I think clip art has kind of emerged as a no-no as well. And maybe just using real photos there or um, creating your own graphics. So I'm actually becoming a really big fan of creating my own. And again, I am not a designer, but I use a lot of different free websites. So my favorite one right now is called Canva. So it's canva.com. And it is basically the simplest site I've ever seen for making your own graphics. And I do it for pretty much every blog post that I write now. And I think it, it looks super professional. You would never know that I threw it together in five minutes before publishing a post. But again, maybe exploring some of those options to to create a more professional looking graphic. Yeah, I'm a fan of, of Canva as well. PicMonkey is another one that I use. Yep. And I actually do most of my stuff in PowerPoint. So I'll grab oh, cool. I'll grab an image from Flickr uh, Creative Commons or from a site like Unsplash and just put over the, you know, whatever the the Im text over image um, to get that done because it looks like these images are a little bit small and I'm curious to get your take on the on the slider. So this, you know, these images we're talking about are in a slider that's five slides deep. And so it starts out with uh, tutoring and homework help, which I think is a very good um, you description. Like, hey, this is, you know, when I'm when I'm on the site for the first time, oh, what is what is a man to do? Hey, homework and tutoring help. Great. Uh, but then it goes on to, you know, a handful of, of other services, you know, workshops and labs. And then it's, um, you know, online resource. So it's kind of there's, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard some some data to suggest that like, you know, every time that slider image is, image is, uh, is shifting, like if I'm reading lower down on the page, like my, my eyeball like automatically uh, diverts back up to it and now mm -hmm. I'm like distracted from whatever I was reading. And, and I don't know if it needs to be, I don't know if it needs to be 5D, but I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, that's a really good point. And actually, I I kind of almost ignored the slider. So I think that there's a missed opportunity here for her to kind of really focus in on one core message on the main page and kind of divert some of those other services or offerings to other pages. So like, you know, you said that you you might get distracted by seeing a change. I actually just kind of scrolled right past it and, and went down to where, you know, it says welcome to Avery Learning Lab and it goes goes on to a little bit more about her offerings. So I think that that actually just made a really good point. You mentioned the slider. I hadn't even really explored the other tabs that are in the slider. So yeah, some of that important content might be buried on the third or fourth slide and, and people might not even see it. Totally. So I would recommend to Amanda that maybe she focus in on one. I mean, I would love to hear what's her what's her elevator pitch. So what in her in 30 seconds, what can she tell you about Avery Learning Lab? Maybe that's what needs to be on just a main static slider here. And then she has the opportunity to kind of go into all of her services and offerings um, either below or, you know, on separate pages. I think that would help because as I'm looking here, I'm not really sure who Amanda's target audience is. And I think that should be a little bit more clearly defined. Got it. Got it. Thank you for your input on that one. And the third site we have is nutritionandhealthyliving.org. This is uh, Sage. You can see her smiling, uh, her smiling face in the sidebar, which I love to see. Beautiful picture, a little selfie that's going on over there. It says, hi, I'm Sage. And um, what, do you, what do we think about this one? So at first glance, I am a huge fan of Sage's blog and website. I, you know, I get on here, I see the header is nutrition, healthy living. I immediately have an idea of what it is I'm going to be looking for. And then, like you said, you know, you scroll down and I see her smiling face. I like that she actually has this cool graphic that she's created that um, includes her photo and a description of who she is. I think that's really great. And then even above that, um, there's another graphic that you can click on that says my story. And I think that is something that is really interesting to people too. People want to hear the story behind why you started your business. And as I was saying earlier, I, I love to infuse my personality and personal stories and even my struggles into my blog post because I think it helps make me more relatable. And I people people like that. People like knowing that you're not some 
such a static brand that doesn't have any feelings or thoughts. And so I love that, you know, right up front, you can, you can see Sage's stories. I think that's really cool. Um, one thing that I would suggest here is it's a little bit busy for me. So I think a homepage should be super simple. Really, there's a lot here and I want to click on everything. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, do I want to read her story or do I want to check out her book? Do I want to check? There's just so much here. I'm not, and I see there's a start here button, which is awesome. I think a start here page is a really good way to kind of direct people. But just, you know, even it took me a few seconds to get to that point on her homepage because I'm, I'm looking around and there's so many awesome photos and I want to click them all. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And a couple of them are, are pretty like underneath my story. There's two ones that are really small. And so it's like, uh, you know, uh, so maybe if I made that my story, the the, the full, uh, I guess, full size on that section there. I like how she's got yeah. kind of this now trending uh, bar at the top, which is a little bit different take on kind of like a, a traditional like hello bar style uh, drop down at the very top. It's like, hey, my mm -hmm. book is now live on Kindle and, and some other things. One thing I was kind of surprised not to see on the site is an email capture anywhere on the homepage that I can Ooh. see. And it seems like, Hey, if we're, if we're in the business of, of selling this book, you know, it's going to be probably the, the most effective way to sell is going to be once you can get in somebody's inboxes. And so I was kind of surprised uh, not to see that because the rest of the site does look pretty well put together. That's a really good point. Yeah. I, I, I haven't seen that. And even in some of the pages I'm clicking around, I, I don't see it an obvious place either. So I think that's kind of a missed opportunity for Sage. And I think that would be really helpful. One thing I do want to point out that I like um, with Sage's site is I've been talking a lot about consistency and how important that is. And I really like that in all the photos, even in every blog post photo, um, she has a, the photo, of course, but then this little blue box that has a little bit more about what it's going to be about. It's something that is really consistent throughout her site. And um, it just it kind of sets the standard for when she posts a photo, it's always going to have this little, you know, tagline header on it. And I, I think that she's done a really great job here with consistency. And that's something that is super important. Yeah, I think so too. It's a good looking site, just a couple, a couple tweaks, and hopefully we can increase the, uh, increase the conversions, increase uh, our sales. And that's, I guess, one, maybe one consistent point across all the websites is, is to think, what's the number one action you want somebody to take when they, when they hit that site for the first time. And right. for me, like if you go to side hustle nation, like the, there's a, a big, like kind of hero graphic and an invitation to join. And so that's like, that's what I would love people to do is like, you know, they'll go to the join page, Hey, sign up for the email list. And, you know, if, and then it kind of like opens up the sidebar and you can kind of explore from there, but that's where I want people to start or dig into, um, you know, a giant list of side hustle business ideas, uh, a couple of different ways you can kind of get into the brand, but that will kind of dictate, you know, the, the hierarchy of font sizes and design and kind of where do you want people to, to funnel through? And I, I agree. There's so, so she has uh, Sage has an option, leave me a voicemail on the, on the right hand side. And then she's got like kind of this sharing little widget on the left hand side. And it's like, yeah, you know, there's a, on top of all the elements on the page itself, there's a lot, there's a lot going on, a lot competing for attention. Mm -hmm. Definitely there is. And, you know, I think the social sharing thing is great, but I don't know. For me, it hasn't really been working. I'm actually considering removing that um, option from each. I have it at the bottom of every blog post. And I'm just kind of thinking of getting rid of that plugin because people don't really seem to be clicking it. And I think that's okay when you are looking at your site and kind of evaluating what works and what doesn't work. It's always okay to pivot and to, to change things and what you might what you might've thought would work when you started your site may not be working years later. And it's okay to make changes. I think people are afraid of that because they, they create a beautiful website and they're so excited about it and, and they don't want to make any changes, but it's definitely okay. And I would say, you know, encourage to, to constantly be evaluating what's working and what's not. Yeah. It's such a fine line with those social boxes of social widgets. Cause it's like, I want, I want people to, you know, tweet my thing. But then, you know, when you put it up there and there's like zero likes, yeah. <laughs> you're like, oh no. Yep. And it looks, exactly. And it looks worse than if you didn't have it at all. Um, so I don't know at what point do you, do you put it in? Cause it's like a chicken or the egg thing. Um, but very good. Thank you. Thank you everyone who, who submitted your site will, um, you know, obviously we didn't have a chance to get to everybody, but hopefully the, you know, hearing us talk through this stuff is a little bit, uh, valuable for you. You're able to implement some things from that. Uh, just we'll move towards wrapping things up kind of, you know, with this, with this side hustler mentality, if you just have 
you, you know, maybe an hour a day, maybe two hours a day to, to work on your business, how do you, how do you prioritize that time? Sure. So if I had an extra hour every day, I would spend that time engaging with my community. So whether your community is, you know, five people or 500 people, I think that personal touch is what helps convert people from, you know, just someone who reads your site to someone who's a huge fan to someone who eventually becomes a customer. So one of the ways that I'm I'm doing that is every time someone signs up for my newsletter, I send them a personal email. So of course they get like the general autoresponder that, that comes, but I usually follow up a couple of days later with an actual personal email from me. And I'll usually look up the person on Twitter or I'll try to check out their site if I see they have one. And I'll try to reference at least one thing that I saw on their site. And again, this is something that takes time. And right now I, I'm able to do that because maybe I get you know 15 to 20 new email signups a week. It's not like I'm getting 500 and it's unmanageable, but that actually has been a strategy that has really worked because people, when they get that email and it's from a real person, they're like completely shocked and they, I think they become more loyal. So they're a little less likely to hit unsubscribe. You, you don't become just another newsletter or another, you know, person that they see in their inbox. You become someone that they trust and then they want to hear from. So that, that's something that has been really working for me. And even as my site grows, I plan to at least try to keep up with that, but if not, at least spend an hour you know, a week or however much time I can, um, actually just picking random people and communicating with them. Cause it also gives you ideas and it, it helps you learn more about your audience. No, I really, I really like that. It's something that I've attempted to do and kind of had to scale it back, uh, the last month or so just to the people. So, so when somebody signs up, they go to like a thank you page and then there's like a little survey, like it says, what's your hustle, you know, and people fill that in. And so like, if they filled that in, you'll get, and you can test this out if you want, you'll get, you'll get a personal note from me that says, Hey, you know what you, how is it going with such and such? Or, you know, what do you think the next first step you should take it, whatever it is, like some kind of connection. Like if I see people, as I'll ask what, uh, you know, what city are you nearest in case, you know, I'm traveling and we can hold a meetup or whatever. Be like, Oh, you know, you're in Seattle. I grew up there or something like that. Yeah. And just, you know, that, that one little piece of, of connection shows you a real person shows you like actually care about what people are working on. I think that is, is good. Like you said, to kind of build people just, Hey, they already, they already trusted you enough to, to put in their email. Right. And now Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, what else can you do to, to reel them into your, into your brand? (laughs) Totally. And I, it's just, I've been blown away by the response and just how much it's helped me. I mean, I have so many new ideas have developed because people have told me what they want. And instead of just guessing what I think people want, I mean, I'm like, it's so, it's so simple and it's such common sense, but now it's like, I just ask and people respond. So it's a great way to kind of survey your audience too. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's been some really, really insightful uh, answers that that come from that stuff. So uh, everyone, Thank you, uh, Jessica. Thank you so much for for joining me. It's jessicalawler.com for the for the personal branding stuff. She's actually offered, uh, been generous enough to offer a fifty percent off discount for side hustle show listeners. So we'll uh, we'll figure out how to get that done and, and link that up in the show notes after the fact. Uh, Jessica, you will wrap things up with your number one tip for side hustle nation. Ooh, okay. My number one tip for a side hustle nation. So I guess besides, you know interacting with your community as much as you can, I would say, you know, my number one tip, and this is kind of weird, but I would say wake up earlier. And that's kind of a strange tip. It's not very tactical in terms of like being an entrepreneur, but, you know, waking up just an hour earlier, even if you start doing with 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30, that extra hour day, you can add an extra hour to your day by waking up an hour earlier and you can really start your day off on the right foot. And I find that when I start my day with, um, that most important task, you know, I, we're all side hustlers. So a lot of us have full-time jobs, but when I start my day with my side hustle, one, I'm in a great mood because I'm working on something that I love. And two, I start the day on a really productive note and it kind of carries through the rest of the day. So I would say wake up earlier. There's, there's something to that. And, and you, I mean, there's some science to say, hey, you, you know, your willpower or, you know, whatever it is, is strongest first thing in the morning or, or early mm-hmm. in the day. It's like, you know, don't don't give your best hours to your employer. You know, take take that for yourself. Build that into your own business. So mm-hmm. absolutely. I, I like it. Jessica, thank you so much. I think this uh, this personal branding talk, kind of the hearing the stories about how the blog led to clients and and 
everything. We're really excited to, uh, to follow along with your journey as well. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. This edition of the Side Hustle Show is brought to you by Airbnb, where you can support the side hustle economy on your next trip, have more space, and stay somewhere with a little more character than your run-of-the-mill hotel room. Uh, Bryn and I stayed in several Airbnb apartments on our recent trip to Spain and Portugal, and they were awesome. We had the whole place to ourselves, and it was nice to have uh, just have some extra breathing room, some space to spread out a little bit more than, than in a hotel. So if you're traveling over the holidays or any time over the next three years, be sure to claim $25 off your first stay when you sign up through the link sidehustlenation.com slash Airbnb. I think Jessica's call to start the day with your most important task is a great reminder because I will be the first to admit I usually start my day on Twitter or email, which is not necessarily going to move my business forward. It's it's very much uh, reactionary time versus proactive time. And, and so I thought that was a good reminder and I need to get better about that myself. Um, and although, uh, you know, the getting up early thing is a little bit tough, but it did feel great right after we got home from our trip. We were up super early uh, from the jet lag. And I like, you know, one morning I knocked out, knocked out my, my top three priorities all before 8 a.m. And it felt it felt great. Uh, so remember to enter to win a free branding boot camp from Jessica. Uh, please be sure to stop by the show notes at sidehustlenation.com slash 83 and leave a comment with your with your URL and your number one branding struggle or question, and we'll pick a winner on December 19th. Also, the, the show notes, or rather on the show notes, you're going to find that free downloadable PDF with all my notes and highlights from the call, along with how you can get Jessica's personal branding checklist and check out some of her material and services as well. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, go out there and make something happen, and I'll see you next week in episode 84. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com.